Hey everyone, Professor Davis again. This time we're going to talk a little bit about the 1-3 diaxial interactions in cyclohexane molecules. So let's start by taking a quick look at cyclohexane in the chair conformation. Remember that in the chair conformation, cyclohexane ring atoms have got a 109.5 degree bond angle and perfect staggered orientations to one another. But remember also that in order to do this, they have to place their substituents in two different kinds of positions. One being equatorial, as pictured on the left, and the other being axial, as pictured on the right. And that these two positions can be interconverted by a process commonly known as a ring flip. Now, axial and equatorial positions have different degrees of space among the atoms. And so larger groups tend to prefer to be in the equatorial position. And therefore, we can model, usually, the behavior of cyclohexane molecules as a two-state equilibrium between one chair in which a certain set of atoms or substituents is in the equatorial conformation and one in which they are in the axial conformation. And it's going to be their desire for this extra space that dictates the equilibrium constant. So let's start by thinking about 1,3 diaxial positions and interactions within a cyclohexane molecule itself without any substituents at all. In this case, I've oriented the molecule so that red atoms are in the axial positions and white atoms are in the equatorial positions. Now I'm going to place an exact copy of this molecule on the right. And then I'm going to rotate this to make the 1,3 diaxial interactions a little bit easier to show you. Now in this orientation I can show you a little bit better what's going on in these 1,3 diaxial interactions. You notice that there's a set of axial atoms at the top of the molecule which are close to one another and that they're on alternating atoms. This is the origin of the 1,3 part of this name. So we call it a 1,3 diaxial because if we were to label the atoms at which these substituents are at which these atoms are located, we would label them 1 and 3. There's a similar set of proximities on the other side of the molecule. So in total, we have six potential 1,3 diaxial interactions for any particular chair conformation of any particular substituted cyclohexane molecule. Now let's take that cyclohexane molecule and do a quick inventory of all the potential or of all the actual interactions within the cyclohexane molecule. On the top, we have three different interactions among hydrogens. On the bottom, also three interactions, all among hydrogens. So there will be a total of six different 1,3 diaxial interactions. But in this case, they're all exactly the same. They're all between two hydrogens. And by default, we make this equal to zero kilojoules per mole. So when we report a 1,3 diaxial interaction energy, we're always comparing it to the baseline of a hydrogen-hydrogen interaction. OK, so let's go a little bit farther now than just a simple cyclohexane ring and place a substituent on that cyclohexane. Now here I've placed a methyl group on the cyclohexane ring, but I placed it in an equatorial position where it's not going to sterically clash with anything. So in this case, I'm going to compare, ultimately, the energy of this equatorial conformation to that of the axial. But of course, with my methyl group in the equatorial position, my 1,3 diaxial interactions are unaffected. So just like in the cyclohexane example, I've got all hydrogen, hydrogen, 1,3 diaxials. So I'm going to place those over here and take an inventory because I'll need to compare this to the diaxial interactions in the other conformer. Now that we have an inventory of all the diaxial interactions that are going on in our equatorial conformer of methylcyclohexane, Let's place that methyl group instead in an axial position and see what kind of effect it will have. So here we have methyl cyclohexane again, but this time in the axial conformation. In the case of an axial conformation, we still have three potential 1,3 diaxial interactions on the top of the molecule, 
and 3 on the bottom. Except that in this case, we now have methyl hydrogen diaxial interactions that are possible. At the top of my molecule, instead of three HHs, I now have only one HH and two methyl hydrogen diaxial interactions. Now on the other side of the molecule, not much has changed. We have exactly the same as we did before. So let's place all of these interactions into our inventory on the right hand side and see how it compares to the conformer which had the methyl group in an equatorial position. So now things should start to become clear. If I look at the differences between the two potential conformers, I notice that in the actual position I have a couple of interactions which are worse off than when it's in the equatorial position. Specifically, those methyl hydrogen interactions add 3.76 kilojoule per mole of instability to the axial conformer. So the total change in energy, if I were to model this as a two-state equilibrium, would be 7.52 kilojoule per mole in favor of the equatorial conformer. So to put this number to use, I can simply use the equation that relates equilibrium constant for a two-state process to the free energy difference between the two states. When I plug my numbers in, let's assume we're at 298 Kelvin, about room temperature, I get a result of 0 0.05 for my equilibrium constant. Now what this really means is that if I am modeling this as a two-state conformational change, that at any given point in time, about 19 or 20 will be in the equatorial conformation compared to one in the axial. So if I want to properly model the behavior of methyl cyclohexane, naturally I'm going to use the equatorial conformer as my approximation of how it looks. And this is why we are concerned with these 1-3 diaxial interactions and how they affect conformational equilibria. And cyclohexanes are just a great way to teach this concept. So I hope you've learned a little bit about it now, and I'll see you next time.